Hello, thank you so much. Um, I'm a proud YGA alumni, and at YGA, we strive to raise double-winged young individuals who are both conscientious and competent and who work together toward creating a better future through innovative technology projects. And our next speaker is actually a great role model for, for all of us. He's a computer scientist, a tech executive, is the co-founder of Google Maps and investor in 50 companies, including one of our um, I, like role model companies, Scanla. So it is my pleasure to welcome Lars Rasmussen. Hello, hi, Dr. How are you? Hi, good. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for well, being here for with us, me. Lars, today. Um, thanks so much yeah. for having me. This is super exciting. Yeah, it's 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 uh, such an amazing opportunity to have a conversation with you and to share it with the with our amazing audience. And at YJ, we say that your life doesn't change with a book or a seminar, but it changes with the people you meet along the way. So I would love to actually start by uh, asking you to share your journey with us, because I know there's like quite a few uh, stories of meeting the right people in there too. <laughs> yes, definitely. Well, it's a, long, it's a long story, as you can tell from my white beard here. Um, I was born and raised in Denmark a long, long time ago. I, I did my first degree in at a university in Denmark in Aarhus. It was a math degree, really. And then I had always wanted to leave the country, see the world. Not that I have anything against Denmark. It's a beautiful country, but the world is so big and so exciting. I managed to get to to Scotland, to the University of Edinburgh. I did a master's degree there. I started a PhD as well. And then my professor, Alice Sinclair in, in, in Edinburgh, he got a job at UC Berkeley in California. And he kind of packed me up in his suitcase and tagged me along. So I, I finished my PhD at UC Berkeley, which is a pretty important school in computer science, very hard to get into. I kind of got a free seat because of Alistair. And then I graduated, so I spent a lot of time in school. I'm not, I'm not recommending either for or against. That's just how I did it. I think I was almost 30 by the time I finally graduated. And now we're in the, um, in the late 90s, the crazy dot-com boom was going on and quite a lot of academics were leaving academia to build startups, internet startups, uh, you know, web 1.0 startups. And, and a professor down the hall, Mike Luby, who's a great friend of mine, fantastic, fantastic theoretical computer science algorithmic math genius he was starting a startup right as a graduate he hired me as his first engineer because i had some programming experience back in denmark when my brother and i were both students at the same time we kind of spend our days coding like as professional coders for a company in the printing industry we did graphical design software for these high-end professional printers and um, and then we'd, we'd kind of like only do our studies right around exams. So, so in Denmark at the time, this is no longer true, you didn't have to show up for class. You just had to pass your exams. And so you could perfectly have a full-time job through the semester, and then you take enough time off around exams to study all your stuff, pass your exams, and go back to, to work. So he hired me because I had that theoretical background from my PhD and some actual engineering experience from my job when I was an undergraduate. And we, we built this company, um, it's called Digital Fountain, had, had fen phenomenal um, uh, had phenomenal technology underlying it, but we didn't quite manage to figure out turning it into the kind of explosive products that people are looking for. And so we raised like $40 million, uh, didn't quite find the product we were working on. And then five years in, the dot-com bubble burst. In, in what, 2001, a spectacular stock crash centered around tech. Um, and Digital Fund started laying people off. My brother got laid off, I got laid off. And um, for other reasons, I had kind of moved to Australia. Digital Fund had an office there. I transferred to Australia. And, um, and when we got laid off, and no one was, everyone was laying off, no one was hiring. My brother was like, hey, Lars, I got these ideas in, in mapping. And I think just the two of us, we can make a prototype and then because no one was hiring we might as well so we did that we worked for a year tried to raise money impossible like everyone had lost all their investments right no one was investing 
we managed to get two of our Australian friends to join the effort. Everyone worked for free. We're using all our savings, and we didn't really have any savings because in the dot com world, everyone's going to be a millionaire overnight. <laughs> and uh, and so a year and a bit in, we tried to raise money again. I flew back to California. We pitched a bunch of the remaining VCs there, and one of them got interested enough that we started exchanging like numbers and potential terms for an investment. We're going to invest two million dollars for forty percent of the company, which by then was a magic deal. Today, it'd be a terrible deal compared to what goes on in startup land now. But but we didn't quite get to the point of them actually making the investment. We had just discussed it. No promises were broken or any such thing, but they just didn't invest in the end, as is often the case, right? You go through this funnel with an investor and you get closer and closer and closer, and only a very small number of the startups that's pitching an investor, in particular big VC in, in Silicon Valley, get through. And we got close, but not quite there. And then we were broke. And um, we didn't know what to do. We asked all the people that had been excited about our tech for help. And one of them, uh, Ram Sharam, who had just barely met him, the investor that didn't invest introduced us to Ram. He was going to be our business guy because we're all techies. He was going to be a business guy. We just met him like once. And he liked what we did. And then when the deal didn't happen, we asked Ram, hey, what do you think we should do? And he said, look, you should go sell yourself to Google. So the, the reason that the investor decided not to invest in our mapping thing was that Yahoo, which was big, a big player back then still, we're in, in the early 2000s, they had just launched a thing on the map site that sort of had tiny little flavors of what we're doing. And the investor said, look, we're afraid your window is closing because one of the big players is playing in your space and we're just, we're just not gonna invest. And then Ram said, look, the same reason the investor decided not to invest is going to make Google want to buy you because back then Google had nothing in mapping. And Google was Yahoo's big competitor and vice versa. And here's a chance if to buy you, they can leapfrog everyone else because what we were designing in maps really was quite different from anything else out there. And so next week we were in a meeting with Larry Page because Ram happens to sit on Google's board, good person to have met. He introduced us to Larry, we pitched it to him. He said, look, I really like this. And, and he suggested a quite a fundamental change actually in our technology. Back then we were writing a C++ application that you would install on your PC. This is long before iPhones and so on. You install this application on your PC because we thought that web browsers were just not powerful enough to deliver the experience we wanted. And Larry said, look, I like your way of thinking about maps, but Google is really a web company. You know, Google was really at the forefront of moving all this stuff from your desktop onto the web. And he's like, are you sure this can't be done in a web browser? And so then we left this meeting in what I like to call a heightened state of motivation, by which I mean that we were broke and had zero other options than selling to Google <laughs> and like really broke, you know, like my next rent check was gonna bounce. And, uh, and, we, uh, and we had maxed, you know, we had maxed out our credit cards with a, a little pension, we, everything was gone, right? There was no more money left. And so we went, it was the most productive three weeks of our lives. We were, worked like 24 seven and we kind of disproved one of the key theses underlying our entire startup, which was that the web was just not powerful enough to deliver these things. And we managed to build an internet explorer, which was the big browser back then, uh, what became Google Maps. We actually like, it was specifically to sell our stuff to Google. And so we even put Google's logo on and, we had little, the markers on the map were little lava lamps because Google really liked lava lamps. It was part of their internal, everywhere inside Google, there were lava lamps. And so we went back three weeks later and we showed this website that could do the, almost the same as our downloadable application. And we were just kind of like, do you mean somewhere like this? After we had, we had blown our own minds that this were even possible. And then Google bought us. Uh, it took a long time because they were busy going public. We're now in 2000. And you were still in Australia when Google bought you. <clears throat> That's right. Yeah. So I was still in Australia. Uh, our two friends were in Australia. My brother was back in California. And so they bought us um, right as they were going public, which is kind of a, a heady time for the company. And having just almost gotten this investment, we were quite sure that we were almost going to be bought by Google as well. <laughs> but they, they actually ended up 
as, as you know, buying us. And they added two people to our team. Um, Brett Taylor was one of them. He, he um, joined as a product manager. Um, Brett is one of the smartest people I know. He's, he, he later became the CTO of uh, Facebook. And he's now the co-CEO of Salesforce and uh, crazy, crazy talented, you know, much, much younger than me crazy talented person anyway i'm talking way too much here yeah <laughs> um i did google maps yeah we did another yeah. project of google google wave that was a equally spectacular failure and, and um, actually like as you talk about your google Maps story it it's like you were in australia your whole team was there your brother was in california and then you all moved back but then you got linked back to australia um That's and right. we actually would love to hear a little bit about that you are one of more importantly you helped melanie and cliff with one of the most important aspects of building their companies which was building their team can you tell us a little bit about your camera story like how you got enrolled um, what you did definitely yeah look there's a, another of my most favorite stories and it was a relatively small amount of work for me but that was only possible because of a million different things that had happened prior including, of course, being in Australia in the first place. And it started with an introduction. So I knew this guy who was an investor. We had, um, he'd been excited about Google Wave and I was in Australia. He liked to come to Australia because he's a kite surfer and Australia has good kite surfing. And so he introduced me to Mel and Cliff. I think they were both still student or very recent graduates, very young. And, and Bill was like, these guys have something. I was like, I can't, it's, but they have something. You gotta, we gotta help them out. They had this idea in building online graphical design tools. And remember I had worked as a programmer in this space 15 years earlier. So I had an affinity towards it. He introduced us and I was immediately captivated by the, just like the tenacity and the passion and the insights that, uh, that Melanie had about the state of design, which everything at the time was adobe all design things had been either bought or out competed by adobe and no one really dared go there and melanie was just like i'm going to do better and and here's how and and in particular it was about capturing the needs of people who are not professional designers because a lot of people will like go and buy two thousand dollars worth of adobe tools just to be able to design a flyer for the hair salon with people who really cared about how things looked, but were not professional designers. And Melanie had this had this vision, and and Bill was like, "Look, why is these guys? They have this vision. They have this tenacity. This incredible work ethic. That's just very compelling. But they don't have technical backgrounds. Melanie was a graphics designer. Cliff was a business student." And Bill said, if you can help them recruit a tech team that you personally approve of, I'll invest. And he told both me and Melanie this. And so we set out to work and it took like a year to just land the first two technologists. It took almost a year. And again, Mel just wouldn't give up, wouldn't give up. And they were both people that I had worked with at Google. And this project that had just ended Google Wave, they'd both been on it. And so I knew a lot of engineers in Australia who were at various stages between projects. And I introduced Melanie to a handful of the best people that had specific skills that all were relevant. And then she set out to recruit them. And it took a while because people are, you know, busy. And uh, one of the one of the the, the five I or six I introduced her to, Cam Adams, who's a brilliant actually designer, but also a really world class programmer. Rare combination to have someone who's world class in both areas he had started his own startup and you can't just like walk away from your own mm -hmm. startup and and luckily he decided with his his co-founders that they were not going to pursue that thing and then he went and joined canvas so he's the third co-founder and that took yeah. a while and then um and uh, and i think one of the great things uh, you pointed out about that is it's yes it's very important to find high caliber people which is what you are helping them with but then you also yes. said the hard part is onboarding them to that vision. So um, exactly. what are and your Google, thoughts on that process? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so Google thought that, so Dave Herndon, the second one was still at Google. And when he announced to Google, he was going to leave, I think Google like five X to salary overnight to get him to not leave. And, uh, and so it took a lot of effort 
uh, on Melanie's part to persuade him to still join. And she wrote this, this has been published now. She wrote a fairy tale about him and her and Canva and Google and me a little bit <laughs> that ends up with him making the right choice. It was like a graphics novel. She's a graphics designer. And joining she, Canva beautiful. and moving to Australia. No, no, he was in Australia. He's Australian. No, so, but so like, was that move. kind of what they were trying to convince them to do? Yes, 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 exactly. And so, and so he joined, and I'd like to think he has not regretted the move. He's the yeah. CTO of Canva now, which is by far, by far, wow. Australia. I think it's like the fourth biggest private, fifth biggest private yeah. startup by evaluation software startup. And uh, they're amazing people. And many of the folks I work with at Google later joined in various capacities. And uh, it's been a fantastic story. And the thing, I, I know we're running a little short of time, but the thing I really want to say, the thing that was really compelling about uh, Melanie and Cliff was the tenacity. They just wouldn't give up, even though it took that whole year to recruit just two of the right level of tech people. It's hard in the beginning when you haven't started, you don't have money. Yeah. And they just wouldn't give up. They just kept coming back. And, and one thing in particular, we were kind of hanging out in this cool group of kite surfing, beach loving, party going <laughs> networks of entrepreneurs, investors, and sports yeah. people. And when we were partying on the beach, Mel and Cliff were in the room working on their pitch. And uh, every every time, they're always in the room <laughs> working on I hope they find some time to enjoy life at some point. But they're like the hardest working people I know. And I often say that I've invested in companies around the world. And often I find it's in the, in the non-obvious places I find the most successful places because you know in silicon valley you graduate from a good school there you can get a four or five hundred thousand dollar job straight out of school which creates sort of almost like an entitlement sense whereas in other places people are more hungry more willing to work hard for little money take the risks that it takes i think to to change the world and so mm -hmm. i my work in athens now and i find the same kind of hunger here now that I found in, in Sydney 20 years ago. I'm, just, I'm sure it's still there. I just don't happen to live there. But but I, I'm very interested in entrepreneurial spirits in the less obvious places. You know, I've worked in Silicon Valley. I've worked in London. I've worked in New York. But I kind of like it best in a place like Sydney or Athens. Or I have not been yeah. to Turkey much, but I imagine it's the same there. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm thank you so much for sharing all of this because your story and in the canvas story that you shared with us, we can see that like what it means to be an entrepreneur. Yes, there is a lot of like celebrations of building your own thing, but it is <clears throat> more than anything. It's hard work. It's tenacity. It's committing to solving this problem. And, and I think in both cases, you described the importance of like solving it for others, like capturing the needs of others who can really who doesn't have access to all of these things. Um, so that brings me to our last question, um, which would be like you studied computer science too, and you invested in a lot of companies. You're a, a tech innovator and investor, and you were at the forefront of all of these like web one, web two, uh, from Google Maps to being an engineer director at Facebook, uh, uh, founding your own startup and investing in them. What would you say to your young self <clears throat> or our audience about the future of technology, Web 3.0, and um, about entrepreneurship? Well, so I highly recommend trying. It's been a tremendous source of joy for myself, also frustration, deep frustration sometimes, uh, and incredibly hard work. I shall not lie to you. In fact, the, I think the, the best advice is don't actually go and build your own company unless you just can't not do it. Like I think I want to build a company. Let me think of something to work on. Might not be the best motivation as, as compared to there's this vision. I, there's a problem I want to solve that I just can't stop thinking about. No one else is doing it. Someone needs to build a new company. You know, Try to persuade yourself not to do it. And if you can't persuade yourself not to do it, then consider doing it because it is it is hard work and, and mostly it fails. This is the, the truth. Of course, the stories we hear are about all the successes, but but nine out of 10 of these efforts fail. And, you know, I think of myself as being relatively successful, but most of the things I've started have, have failed. And so that's one thing. The other thing is that tenacity and not giving up, uh, those are 
unbelievably important things. Like when I look back at Google Maps, there are many times when we probably should have given up or any sane person would have given up. And it's not because we're actually like made out of steel, but just that no one was hiring. And so we thought, oh, there's nothing else to do. We might as well continue. But I have since come to understand that it was because we didn't give up when things were looking really terrible for us. Um, that's why it became such a big success. And, and so that, that I think is super important. The last thing is that there's never been a, a time, I think, in the world with more like technological breakthroughs just waiting to happen in, in, in clean energy, in cryptocurrency, in uh, fusion energy in particular. It blows my mind that that might actually happen soon. I'm personally getting really excited about quantum computers, um, which will take an hour to explain if you don't happen to know what it is. Uh, but quantum computer is this thing that, that kind of mathematically blew up when I was in grad school 25 years ago, 30 years ago, that is now starting possibly to be feasible to build. And so there is tons and tons of things to get into. I think many of them are very kind of deep tech, requires a lot of education and knowledge to do. Whereas maybe when I started 30 years ago, you could, a small team of software engineers could build something much more impactful, much more quickly. And I think now there's sort of a, there's a tendency to need something somewhat deeper, which I think is a, is a great thing. And don't be, don't be afraid to go there. I think is the, is the key lesson. I think I may have held back a little bit, but I can't wait to d dive into quantum computing now, which is probably the most intensely theoretical, deep, crazy, wacky, thing you could possibly do in, in my field. Thank you. I mean, I, I, and I would have to admit that this is really powerful for us and our audience too, because at YJ, the YJ Impact Companies, they're always looking for the right people who believe in that vision. So as you mentioned before, if we, if we don't have an idea that we're crazy about solving, we should be joining the teams whose vision we really do believe exactly. in. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, yeah, you know, statistic. You so yeah, statistic. <laughs> sorry. I was just saying, statistically, if you're looking for success, you are much better off joining someone else's rocket ship than trying to build your own. Um, but someone, someone does have to build that rocket ship. Thanks. Um, well, thank you so much, Lars. We really appreciate you graciously accepted our offer to share your journey with us, and it's a. Uh, amazing journey of um, the struggles of building your own company, but also the commitment to doing it and doing it with the right people toward the right vision, like from your um, college days, going with Alistair to uh, Berkeley, to me meeting your team, to uh, meeting other investors, meeting the team of Canva, um, everything uh, aligns a lot with what the the community we're trying to build at YGA. So thank you so much for sharing your story. That's a pleasure. It's a pleasure, guys. Uh, it's very exciting. I hope to meet everyone who's in the audience here. Maybe, maybe those who do start a company come ask me for an investment or other help. <laughs>